Hi everyone, my name is Jenny and I'm back today to do another video. Today I'm going to be doing my first review and discussion video for my African Women Writers Project. I will put a link up in the cards above for my announcement for this project, which I announced back last month and will be continuing to do throughout the rest of 2020. The first book that I will be discussing for this project is The Dragonfly Sea by Yvonne Adiampo Awar. So I will first start off with an introduction into Awar and then the novel and then we'll go into my five guiding questions which I talked about in my introduction announcement video. Um, so Awar is a Kenyan writer who was born in Nairobi in the 1960s and was educated at Kenyatta University in English and then received a Master's of Philosophy from the University of Queen Queensland in Australia. Awar won the Kane Prize for African Writing, which is a prize that awards $10,000 to a short story writer who is from the African diaspora. And Awar won this prize in 2003 for her short story, Weight of Whispers. Her debut novel, Dust, was published in 2014. Additionally, she's also been featured on TED Talks, so I will put a link to her TED Talk wherein she discusses writing and the importance of writing and telling own voices stories in the description box below. And then her sophomore novel, The Dragonfly Sea, came out in the United States in 2019 and is published by Knopf. So The Dragonfly Sea tells the story of Ayana, who's a young girl living in off the coast of Kenya on the island of Pate. Ayana and her mother Munira have been ostracized mainly from the community in large part because Munira is a single mother. So because Ayana has never known her father. She's only lived with her mother. Throughout the narrative, Ayana has been looking for a father figure in her life. And that is what jumpstarts the novel when Ayana meets an older man named Mahudin, who is a recluse himself. He is not a really active member of the community, but he begins to educate Ayana in a variety of different subjects, including geography, particularly nautical geography. Her relationship with this newfound father figure helps to develop her love of education, which eventually serves her well when a couple of Chinese diplomats come to Kenya with the offer of a scholarship for a Kenyan student to attend university in China as part of a new diplomacy program. This diplomacy program is to incorporate Kenyan and China's shared ancestral history through Zen He, who is a 14th century merchant, a very fascinating historical figure if you have not heard of him, who traded with East Africa in the 14th century. And so the Chinese government believes there are some ancestral ties to some of the people living in coastal Kenya uh, to China and therefore want to create this diplomatic program for the descendant or a young Kenyan person to travel and study in China. So Ayana is picked to study and the novel progresses through there as she journeys to the Far East both on a ship and then throughout her years at university and she discovers a lot about herself and about her country while she is there. So that's kind of the basic summary of the novel. Okay so after that introduction to the novel I'm going to be moving into my five guiding questions. I have reorganized them and reworded a few of them slightly just uh, because it felt that the flow of the conversation worked best if I reorganized the order of the questions and I will be using this format moving forward. Forward. So the first question is what are the major themes of the novel or what dialogues is the novel contributing to? So given its length this novel is about 480 pages. This novel has a lot of thematic elements and a lot of things larger dialogues that it's contributing to. So thematically the novel has a lot of themes of growing up, becoming an adult, particularly a woman in Africa as well as in China, as well as ideas of home and how that idea can change over time as well as distance. Finally, this novel also, as I alluded to previously, it talks a lot about family and who is a part of your family and how do people join your family or how do you feel connected to your family members. As the title would suggest, there's also some thematic elements regarding the ocean or the sea and how it is both a carrier of memories and it's a carrier of relationships and it the sea allows for relationships to develop both personally within people as well as on an international scale within countries that share an ocean. In terms of larger conversations within literature this one was also contributing to quite a few of those including a dialogue of Kenyan politics and East African politics more broadly particularly the relations between the majority Christian groups within several countries in East Africa versus the co mainly coastal minority Muslim groups. Um, so given that Ayana and her family are Muslim, as are many of the people living on the island of Pate, there's a lot of discussion regarding their Muslim ancestry and religious beliefs in comparison to the larger Christian majority beliefs in Kenya. Just for some background information in case you're not familiar with kind of that 
dialogue. There's a bit of a cultural shift between like the coastal regions of East Africa, mainly in my experience in Tanzania and Kenya, as the coastal region was very largely shaped by interactions of trade for many centuries with the Middle East. So there's a lot of Arab influence in terms of the architecture, the style of clothing, the general cultural norms, and then religion. So in on both the coast of Tanzania and the islands therein and Kenya, there is a majority Muslim population that is, oh sorry, the light is coming in the window so it might change the lighting. <laughs> there is a majority Muslim population on the coast which then transitioned to a more and more Christian population as you move further inland, which is the British came from the west moving eastward so it makes sense that the Christianity kind of hit a point where Islam had already been established. In recent years, particularly in Kenya, which has a fairly tumultuous uh, political history, um, this has meant there's been some disparities in terms of the infrastructure and financial development of the coastal region, particularly these islands, and that's something that's discussed quite a bit in Ayana's story is that Pate has kind of been left behind by the rest of Kenya in terms of its financial and uh, infrastructure development. And then most importantly to our purposes in reading this novel for this reading project, this novel deals a lot with ideas of globalization, international aid, and neocolonialism. So while I originally thought, and I said in my announcement video, that this novel is like a dual timeline narrative, it's not. It is just a contemporary novel that begins in the 1990s and continues to the present-ish day, I think like early 2000s, early to late 2000s. Although it does feature heavily this 14th century Chinese merchant narrative that is not an actual plot or timeline within the story. Nevertheless, or has a lot to say about neocolonialism, international aid, and globalization, particularly China's role in East Africa as well as Africa more broadly in terms of providing international aid and infrastructure development, but also a legitimization by the Chinese government in allowing for their presence, continued presence and increasing presence in a lot of these countries. This is particularly relevant to a quote on page 276 that says, cohabitating with shadows, here was the weight of a culture with a hulking history now preparing itself to digest her continent. Here she was with something of this land already in her blood, being made into something of a conspirator, anointed with the sobriquet the descendant. Which leads us right into our second question, which is how is colonialism and or neocolonialism discussed in the novel? What role does it have in the narrative? So as I said, this novel deals extensively with China's role in helping to develop uh, East Africa structurally and financially, as well as the legitimization of that aid through China's cultural ancestral ties to East Africa. This is particularly pertinent through Ayana as she is the descendant of Zen He and therefore is invited to join the upper classes or upper echelon of Chinese people in attending a university in China. As with other colonial or neocolonial narratives, we also see Ayana arrive to China and be tasked with becoming the Africa interpreter for many of the Chinese people that she interacts with at university who know very little to nothing about Africa, despite the fact that they are increasing their presence and interactions with East Africa. This whole aspect of the novel was particularly fascinating to me, as I've not read anything about China's international involvement aside from its relationship with the United States. So it was really fascinating to see that China is engaging in these similar dialogues of neocolonialism in countries throughout the world that uh, as a per as an American I am just totally unaware of. Additionally this novel also provides some really fascinating parallels between China's work in East Africa, um, particularly in the building of railroads, and also in taking people from Kenya to be educated in China and then I assume to send them back to enter the political scheme of Kenya and therefore be a spokesperson for China. Um, those parallels between that and the British colonial project are so pertinent and fascinating that I really enjoyed that aspect of this novel as well. Moving on now to our next guiding question which is how are women featured in the narrative? Are they the main characters or are they side characters? As I said, the main character Ayana is a woman and she is our main character. Additionally, her mother Munira features heavily, particularly a discussion of her dreams being kind of pushed to the side as she had to take on motherhood alone. There are some romantic, heterosexual romantic relationships, particularly in the second half of the novel, as well as some sex in terms of both some non-consensual sex early on in the novel when Ayana's a early teen, as well as some later consensual sex between a couple different people in Ayana's life as she is in China. So there is some 
development of relationships but there's also a lot of discussion of Ayana and Munira's relationship and their relationships outside of men. Next up we have how is history particularly the history of families discussed and as I already discussed in previous parts of this video there is a larger dialogue happening between the establishment of ancestry in Kenya as a legitimization of China's colonial uh, colonial-esque projects in East Africa. So there's definitely connections between the idea of family and family relations as a way of being used to further international aid. Additionally, there is a more personal and more thematic element of family in the discussion of families in Ayana's development of her relationship with her newfound father figure, Muhudin. And so there's a lot of musings throughout the novel as to what a family means and whether family members need to be tied to tied by blood to be considered family. So those are my five kind of thematic, more critical questions. And now I'm going to quickly talk about some of my personal thoughts about the novel. So obviously this novel was a fantastic place to start with this project. There was so much to unpack here. In fact, I didn't even unpack all of it during this video. There's a lot more in terms of like subplots and other things that didn't directly relate to my questions that I didn't get into. And it got me to think a lot about colonialism and neocolonialism and international aid and how those things are playing out on the global sphere outside of my like American centric mind. So that was also really beneficial. So thematically and kind of in terms of its ability to engage in other dialogues. This was definitely a, like four or five star read. Unfortunately, I didn't love the writing style or the way the narrative progressed necessarily. The novel's writing style is incredibly flowery, about the most flowery writing I've read in a really long time, which sometimes made it hard to even understand what was happening in a particular scene. I feel like a lot of things went unsaid to the point that it started to be a detriment to the novel in that I would reread a couple scenes a couple times to make sure I actually understood what was happening and who was saying what and uh, what the kind of larger point of this in terms of the bigger plot was. So that made it somewhat hard to follow the narrative at times, which is obviously less enjoyable than a very like clear-cut narrative. As I said, there were also several subplots that I didn't even get into in this video, including a commentary on equating Muslim men with terrorists and kind of the problematizing of that, which was interesting, um, as well as a period during which Ayana develops a relationship with a Turkish man while studying in China. And there's some interesting dialogues in terms of Turkey on the international global political sphere. So that was all very fascinating. There's just like a lot of subplots happening, which again also kind of brought down my rating a little bit of this novel in that it felt so complex and that Aurora was trying to interact with so many different ideas that sometimes it didn't feel quite cohesive, which I do think if it had been a bit of a simplified narrative, it might have been even stronger in the parts that were really well developed and really fascinating. So overall, I would say this was like a 3.5 star read for me. Again, the like thematic and kind of dialogue elements of it were phenomenal. Just the actual writing style and how clear the narrative was, was not as great as I really wanted it to be. But I would still highly recommend it for like a thematic reading experience. And that's going to wrap up the end of my first discussion video for my African Women Writers Project. As a reminder, next month I'll be talking about Kintu by Jennifer Nansumbuga Makumbi. Um, this is a Ugandan novelist, so moving just right next door from Kenya, that begins in 1750 and follows the Kintu clan through the colonial period and then I believe afterwards. So very excited about this one. This will be the July pick. Additionally, if you have read The Dragonfly Sea or are now interested in reading it, please let me know any of your thoughts or ideas down in the comment section below. Finally, if you found my channel through this video, please give it a subscribe as I make a lot of similar content to this one. I think that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching and I will talk to you next time.